Hello and welcome back to Like Maria. Today I'm going to talk to you about Romanticism. This video will be especially useful for students doing GCSE Poetry Anthology. So, by the end of today, you'll know about Romanticism and poetry just like Maria. So, Romanticism, we define looking back on the era as a period of the late 18th century moving through the 19th century, a period where in art there was a particular movement of people that shared similar ideas and aspirations. I'm going to talk to you today specifically about the poets involved in that. So during this early 19th century, late 18th century era, Many poets were feeling the need to change the way of writing poetry, change the subject that poetry was written about, and just generally shake up poetry. Now, they didn't all sit in a room and say, right, we're going to be romantics and write a new type of poetry. But this was kind of a spirit and a feeling of the time. It's important to note that some critics and scholars relate this feeling to poets having a reaction to the idea of rationalism. Now, rationalism was from the previous century, from the 18th century a, and late in the 17th century, a movement or a feeling, a way of analysing the world about one that depended on reason, knowledge and was trying to create a sense of order in the world. So you might say that the rationalists and the artists and the poets associated with rationalism um, were very, in some ways, um, clinical about their view of the world. And many people say that the romantics reacted against this. And the romantics, instead of being interested in order um, and reason, were really trying to connect with their feelings, emotional feelings. They looked around themselves in the world and perceived different feelings and emotions and they imagined their responses and they imagined their feelings. So we might say that Romanticism seems to be quite a modern view of the world where people are interested not just in hard facts and knowledge but in people's perceptions of the world about them their emotional responses and their art is created through these emotional responses. One key romantic philosopher that you may have heard quoted is Rousseau and a key quote that's very useful to look at is he says man is born free and everywhere he is in chains and this is at the beginning of Rousseau's um, writings um, on the social contract, the text that's known as the social contract. And what he's saying there is really as children, we are born free and we have much freedom to experience the world. But sometimes we surround ourselves in chains and bog ourselves down with the acquisition of knowledge. And this, I'm sure those of you that have read Blake's London can relate to. So why is this romanticism important in literature and how can we use it in our analysis of poems? So as I've said, romanticism gives us a new type of poetry. It concentrates on the world of nature, the world of feelings. It looks sometimes at strange and exotic places and ideas. It deals with the creative powers of the imagination. The Romantic poets were very much interested in what they could imagine might be a setting for their poem. It looks at the value of individuals rather than a whole crowd of people. It looks at the idea of spontaneity and freedom. The idea that we don't have to stick to the rules all of the time, that we can have and pleasure and enjoy the world by being out in it and observing it and experiencing it. There is some sense in Romanticism of a kind of rebellious streak. These people, these poets were rebelling against what had gone before and they also were slightly politically rebellious. Another key idea that you need to note about this is that these poets were all very strong individuals and they did 
um, encourage a cult of the artist as some kind of prophet. So the poet had things to tell people in the world. A poet had dreams and um, imaginations that they wanted to share and they somehow were leaders in the cult of the imagination, we might say. So you can see here that all of this is very different from the clinical, rational, orderly um, approach of the rationalists that was based on reason. Um, the Romantic poets very much were indulging in the sensual experiences of life. Some of you may have studied um, poems like The Prelude, Ozymandias, London, She Walks in Beauty, To Autumn. Now, all of these have elements of what I've been talking about, the romantic vision. So just quickly, I'm going to go through those um, briefly note about the things that you might say about those poems related to romanticism. So in Wordsworth's The Prelude, uh, we have this discovery, this voyage of discovery and looking at the amazing vision of the mountain that um, rears up um, beyond the lake. So the young boy rose um, on this voyage of discovery. This is a completely romantic um, image. A young boy sets out in an innocent way and then discovers the beauty and the magnificence of nature. Ozymandias, we have um, here Shelley talking about how nature is greater than human structures and human power really and how to be a king in the world um, is something that will not last forever, whereas the desert will, and the desert um, is able to overcome um, the power of the human. In London, as I've already mentioned, Blake talks about humans being chained, um, that um, they are crying, um, crying out um, from some humanity. Um, they are in a terrible situation caused by poverty and political oppression and this is Blake, um, one of the very early romantics, on a kind of politically rebellious um, note trying to um, get um, some attention for the woes of, of people. Um, we have Byron, she walks in beauty. Here nature and beauty are hugely connected and a really emotional response here to um, the feminine and then of course what might be the absolute epitome um, of romantic poetry um, Keats's ode um, to autumn. The, um, here he talks about the beauty of nature in very sensual, sumptuous, mellifluous um, tones um, and of course relates um, that natural cycle um, to death. Um, so all of those poems, you can see that they are in the Romantic tradition, um, mainly because the way they deal with individuals, the way they deal with the journey of discovery and the way they deal with beauty and nature. This idea of beauty and being completely overcome by a sense of beauty um, is very important to the Romantic poets. Um, Wordsworth, um, in his preface um, to one of his collections of poetry, um, says this. Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquillity. And here he's referring to the overwhelming, spontaneous overflow of emotion that people who experience nature can often feel. So to see um, a sunrise or a powerful um, seascape um, or a terrible storm is not something that one should fear. There is an element of fear in it, but that fear should be translated into an idea of beauty. In particular, you may have heard the word sublime used to talk about this romantic experience. Um, late in the 18th century, Edmund Burke described experiencing the sublime. I'm just going to read you what he wrote. He says, the sublime is the passion caused by the great and the sublime in nature. When those causes operate most powerfully is astonishment. And astonishment is that state of the soul 
in which all its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. So Edmund Burke defines this experience of the sublime as, and I quote, astonishment. He says, astonishment is that state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. He's saying that when you see something truly beautiful, you feel this astonishment and it's as if your emotions are suspended. There is something horrific as well as magnificent in the seeing of beauty. And that might be natural beauty, um, beauty in another person, or the beauty triggered by a piece of art or poetry. As well as talking a lot about beauty, the Romantics also were very political. I've already mentioned that Blake was quite critical of the way that people were treated. Um, all of this um, political ideology can be traced back to the French Revolution. Um, the Re French Revolution was a uprising by people that felt downtrodden in Paris and basically the, they tried to dismantle the hierarchy of the French kings and all the um, hierarchy and power that came with those um, rulers. And so they rose up, it was quite a bloody revolution and in London, people were nervous about this, quite naturally. Um, people thought, well, it's only just happened across the channel. Maybe we might have some problems concerning this. Um, so what happened was that in the early part of the 19th century, there was a great suppression um, of people being able to express themselves. Um, we might call it a increase in a draconian form of government. People weren't allowed to get together to talk about um, their working conditions. There were the anti-combination acts. People were demanding um, the right to vote. Um, you might have come across um, the Peterloo massacre in 1819 and the government were being very harsh in suppressing all these uprisings. Um, so the romantic poets were really battling against this. They wanted people to be able um, to have a voice as individuals, um, but also to come together and discuss their problems and create change in government for the better of the mass of the people. OK, I'm just quickly going to go now through the characters involved that you will come across in your GCSE. So they are William Blake, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. They are the what we call the early romantics. Uh, William Blake in particular is very concerned with social conditions. William Wordsworth um, is famous for talking about how amazing the daffodils were in his poem Daffodils. But living in the Lake District, he was very much talking about this awe and splendour, the sublime in nature. And Coleridge, of course, is very famous for the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Um, and in that poem, he looks at um, individual um, responsibilities um, and looking at um, the way that um, the lonely um, mariner is forced to tell his story um, and forced to repent. We then have um, Byron, Shelley and Keats and these are known as the later romantics um, and they of course um, kind of worked in mostly in the 19th century um, and were very um, interested in nature, um, in Italian and Greek culture in particular, looking back to the classics. Um, not quite as political as Blake, although Shelley um, indeed was um, very critical of the current regime. You can read his um, poem England 1819, um, which is a key um, attack on the current regime. Um, and they did have their own political agendas um, certainly um, Byron did, um, but Keats in particular talking lots about beauty um, in nature and the experience of nature in, in extraordinary detail and through his poetry bringing um, that awe and um, beauty into um, people's minds. And just a very last um, thing to mention is that although these six poets that you have in your anthologies are um, the core of the romantic um, poetry, um, there were female poets um, around at the time who were also 
um, working, um, but they have not gone down in history. So there is a big thrust um, because obviously at the time males dominated um, publishing, um, but there are some people um, that you can um, go away um, and read um, about. So one of them is Wordsworth's sister, Dorothy Wordsworth, um, but also you have um, Mary Robinson and um, Felicia Hemans, um, who were also working in that era. So I hope that you've enjoyed that whistle stop tour of romanticism. Please like if that has been useful to you. Um, and I hope you come back and listen to some more videos to help you with your studies.